third speaker is Akani uh, Daliai. He is the founder of Revava Limited, a not-for-profit organisation promoting major initiatives that contribute to Australia's engagement with the Pacific. Uh, Mr Daliai is a Tongan community leader and a former Commonwealth Games athlete who is passionate about connecting Pacific diaspora communities. Thank you, Christian, um, and uh, Malala Lee. Um, I'm very uh, happy to be here this evening, and I'm very grateful for this organisation to have, um, have invited me here. It's not very often that I uh, get to speak publicly, publicly like this on issues that are very passionate, that I'm very passionate about. So before I, um, I move on, and I'll explain a little bit about the depth of this comment, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the traditional landowners, uh, of which uh, um, I consider my community to be a guest here. Um, and I, to be respectful of my shared cultural tradition, um, I am of mixed blood. I, I, I am a dual citizen of Australia and Thai, but to be respectful of the culture of which, uh, of the place that I was born, I need to declare what I'm not, and then after I speak, I'll leave it up to you to decide what it is that I am. I'm not a diplomat. I am not a politician. I'm not an economist. I am a citizen of Australia and a citizen of Thai, a little country in the Pacific. I learned that from a very early age, listening to uh, community leaders in Thai, and eventually here in Australia, um, as they engaged their community, their citizens, on issues that could be considered extremely small to issues that were of national importance. There is a declaration that you make about what you are not, and then uh, you leave it to the population to decide what it is that you are. So I'll leave it at that. I, I, uh, I was very pleased when uh, when Peter, um, who I met not only, uh, only maybe a, a couple of months ago, um, to have the opportunity to uh, engage with not only the Global Dialogue Foundation, but to have the opportunity, opportunity to bring my community um, to start having a presence um, with the, the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. Um, my community of which I am heavily involved is the Tongan Victorian Association, um, as well as a broader Pacific Island uh, community peak body. Um, it is called United Pacifica Council of Victoria. We are certainly looking to branch out to network and to work in partnership with anyone and everyone who is interested in, in considering that we can add value to to this society of which we live. A little bit of uh, some statistics, and these are not from the Bureau of, St of Statistics. If, if you uh, look at their stats um, about uh, Pacific Islanders who reside, or rather, Australians of Pacific Island heritage who reside here in Australia, you will see, if you look deeply, that the statistics will consider anyone coming from Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, coming by New Zealand, they will be considered New Zealanders. So the true number of, of Australians of Pacific Islander heritage are far greater than what the statistics show. In Victoria alone, and if I use my, my Tongan community as an example, we are looking upwards of maybe between 15 and 20,000 uh, members uh, of Victorian society of Tongan heritage. If we add roughly seven uh, communities from the Pacific, including Tongan, Samoan, Cook Islander, Niue, Kiribati, um, Tuvalu, and Maori, you're looking at around 200, 250,000 um, residents of Victoria. Now, New South Wales will have a far greater number. The Bureau of Statistics don't reflect that, and we have uh, um, make efforts to try and correct uh, those statistics. Now considering that in the Pacific of those seven countries that I mentioned alone, and there will be others, uh, the population out in the Pacific region would be pushing well over a million. 
So a million added in the Pacific of these seven countries and about 200,000 are here. Worldwide, there is probably two or three times more Pacific Islanders outside the Pacific than there are in the Pacific. That issue alone uh, is something that is slightly considered, but not fully considered, when uh, looking at how the economies of those various countries, and, and I'm speaking to, uh, I suppose, a bunch of people who are very interested in, in foreign affairs, that the economies of these specific nations are held up through the contributions of this diaspora. Of, of these people who have migrated overseas, who contribute uh, to the societies of which they've gone to, uh, raised money and sent back to what some of them will still con consider home. Tonga, for example, without remittances from Australia, the US, uh, uh, New Zealand, and increasingly China, a lot of Tongans are going to China, um, without the money contributed back uh, to Tonga, the economy would totally collapse. Now, that's just a little bit of a background about uh, where these communities come from, and I'm sure that most of you know a little bit about uh, those, uh, those descriptions, but what I would like to focus on is the issues faced by these communities here in Australia. But the very reason why I got involved in um, my community, and as I explained before, I'm of, of mixed blood, I couldn't, there was a time in my life when I tried to run away from that. And a lot of the young people um, of Pacific Island heritage, and I'm sure, I'm sure uh, many other ethnic groups, you go through a phase where you, you just don't want to have to handle the, the culture, the issues of which is a heritage, something inbred in you. So there came a time when I went through that phase. Then inevitably, and I say inevitably because it is clear with almost every young person of, uh, of Australian citizenship with a Pacific Island heritage, there is this ingrained pull towards uh, doing something or being involved in something to do with the heritage of their parents and their very own heritage. So for over 15 years, I've been heavily involved in my Tongan community to begin with in trying to establish a recognised uh, registered body of which we could address our issues. I can't pretend to say that it was an easy process, it was an extremely hard one. And it was very hard because of my lack of appreciation in how faith leadership was very much ingrained in those societies. Across the Pacific, if I remove the Maori community for, for a second, across the Pacific, Christianity is the predominant uh, faith, and it has very much, Christianity, whether you like it or not, has very much um, ingrained itself in culture, in society, and politics. So to engage Pacific Island communities fully, you needed to involve faith leadership. There have been, in Victoria alone, three or four attempts at bringing these communities together, these particular faith groups together, um, of the Tongan uh, community alone, and the experience is very similar to the other Pacific Island um, communities here in Victoria. In the middle of 2010, with the fourth attempt, we had finally managed to get agreement across all community leaders and faith leaders to come together and address the, the, the issues they thought were uh, important to them. Now, unfortunately, one of the main reasons why they decided to agree on things is the fact that um, young people of Pacific Island heritage are the largest number represented in juvenile justice. And this is not uh, per head of population, this is by pure numbers. And considering the small numbers of the community here, um, that's uh, a startling fact. 
Now, either throw away the key when you lock them up, or try and find um, the issues or the reasons why this is happening. Over the 15 years I'm trying to get the community together, there hasn't, I must admit that there hasn't really been a great effort from government to try and work with community to try and, and, and see what these issues were or, or why these issues were, were, were happening. It has taken, and there's a recognition now that we needed to add value to this society, so we had to take the responsibility of getting together and having a good, honest look at why this was occurring. At the same time, while I was working with the Tongan community, there were various individuals working um, with the Cook Islanders, with the Samoans, uh, the Fijians, as I mentioned, Niue, Kiribati, uh, and the Maoris. And in the last six months, there has been uh, a concerted effort by the leaders across these Pacific Island communities to come together to form a peak body um, that hopefully would address and support the issues that are common. Similar to the attempts to, to get a Tongan recognised uh, incorporated body, there have been uh, attempts in the, in the past few years to create a peak body for Pacific Island communities. One of the problems um, with uh, those unsuccessful attempts has been infighting, uh, has been, so internally, internally there were issues amongst, the, you know, between agreement of what to, to tackle and so forth, but also from state government and, the, and federal government, there was a recognition, or not a recognition, a view that Pacific Islanders were all in the same space. There was no recognition that these groups, even though they come from the Pacific region, uh, have separate identities, have separate cultures, and are, are separate people. It's only <coughs> of late that this has been seen as uh, something that need, needed to be addressed on separate, uh, with separate people. So this peak body has come up at the same time as the efforts to establish uh, truly representative Pacific Island communities. I'm very pleased to to have uh, involved or, or the involvement of Peter uh, from the Global Dialogue Foundation while all this was happening. And I look forward to some conversations that we can have, not only internally here in Australia, but the connections into the Pacific region. Now, they're the issue. The issues are mainly youth. Obviously, we have similar issues to every other uh, ethnic group with elderly, isolation, um, identity crisis, uh, poverty and so forth, but at the top of our list at the moment is youth. Now to try and find solutions for these issues, it has been an interesting exercise to discover or to uh, firm up the belief that addressing issues in Australia for diasporic communities of Pacific heritage, you cannot do that without addressing issues in the Pacific where these people have come from. You cannot find effective solutions in Australia to address the issues of, of Australian citizens of Pacific Island heritage without solutions at the same time in the Pacific. And the main reason, um, as I mentioned before, is the issue of remittance. Now, I, I noted that in the, in the recent Chogham meeting, there was comment made on um, how uh, remittances were made easier <coughs> for uh, Pacific Island communities to send money back, or cheaper, which is great. What hasn't been discussed publicly really is the difference between personal remittance and institutional remittance. Personal remittance occurs almost with every ethnic group, where you send money back to to family mem members, brothers, sisters, parents, to help pay with school fees, to, to build a toilet block, or things like that. But institutional remittance is the bane of a Pacific Island community member's existence. Institutional remittance is the pressure put on 
diasporic communities by churches, by schools, by organisations to raise money and send back. And it's easy to say, just say no, but the sense of obligation to do so is far stronger. You will have uh, members of churches or members of, of uh, schools uh, touring Australia, New Zealand, the US, wherever there is a Pacific Island community and trying to raise money. And I'm talking about between fifty and $100,000 Australian sent back within a four or five week touring period. Now, on the surface, that, that sounds fine. And it is, uh, it is a responsibility that uh, community members take on readily. However, when you consider that um, uh, money sent into the Pacific through aid, such as AusAid and so forth, New Zealand aid, that money is supposed to address the, the poverty issues to alleviate, and you would think alleviate, the need for remittance. So the question then is, how effective is that aid? And I do also note that uh, AusAid have just gone through um, a restructure of late. But it's a little concerning when you have a chocolate meeting and that type of issue is only glossed over. Whereas they say, oh, we're making it easier to send the money back, but not really looked into uh, how problematic remittance is. You will ask any Pacific Island community member about how they, how they felt or how they feel about sending money. They will say, it is my duty. It is something I'm happy to do. Now, I am not putting blame on uh, donors. I'm not putting blame on organisations such as AusAid or New Zealand Aid. What I am trying to address is that there needs to be a recognition through this diasporic community here in Australia, in New Zealand, in the US, that there is an effect. There is an effect on them, and the majority of them are citizens of those particular countries, and the main effect is increased poverty because of an ineffective pathway of money that is supposed to address various issues. Tonga, for an example, when it comes to education, it is the reverse of Australia. Secondary education, less than 5% of secondary schools is run by the state. The remaining 95, or thereabouts, is run by churches, predominantly, if not all, by churches. Aid money going towards the education sector is sent to that 5% Predominantly, the remaining 95% of schools need to compete with that. They can't. Where do, where do we find money to compete with the, with the 5%? Oh, we'll look at our communities overseas. We can't uh, access the money that is supposed to be filtered down to us. So we need to lean on our communities overseas. So as the Tomlin community. Uh, is getting itself organised as the, the Pacific Island communities are getting themselves organised. In a sense, this citizen diplomacy is, is, is going to start to emerge where the voices of these people in raising the concern about uh, things that are happen happening on an international level is affecting us here in Australia. That needs to be addressed because glossing over issues such as young people getting, getting into crime um, if you dig a little deeper and you ask these young people, of which we have, uh, how do you feel about your parents sending money back? Oh, we, we're extremely proud of how our parents have come here and, and have worked hard and have sent money back. However, I go to school and I find out that my school fees haven't been paid. And that's besides the fact that I didn't have any lunch. And this is no excuse. But some will choose the path of, oh, he's got some lunch. I'm bigger than he is. I'll take it off him. Or he's got a bit of pocket money. I'll take it off him. 
that's the end result. It is not an excuse, and it should not be uh, glossed over at all. But for my community, which I'm very passionate about, I can see the causes way back towards the major issue of institutional remittance. All this is happening in my community, in the Pacific Island community, then all of a sudden this idea of citizen diplomacy comes up. And we are, as, as a board of the Tongan Association and a board of, of this peak body for Pacific Island communities, extremely excited at being possibly offered a seat at the dialogue table. Whoever is having the conversation and wherever it is. Because apart from, and you may not have heard this, but the general uh, comment that an islander would say when they are asked, oh, what, what is it you do here in Australia? And the, the answer would be, oh, I'm just a poor Pacific Island boy trying to make it in a white man's world. Now, it very much saddens me, and, and I get really angry when they feel that that is the only reply that they can give. Again, I'm not putting blame on the wider society of which they have chosen to come to. I am putting, I guess, trying to highlight where the opportunities are to use this concept of citizen diplomacy to find some really effective and sustainable solutions. One of the, the, the things that I had done with this Orvava organisation, which um, Christian had mentioned, is to try and put the spotlight in the Pacific region and connect it to young people, young Australians of Pacific Island heritage. To my huge surprise, when I went to, to this bastion of white Australia, the Young Endeavour Youth Scheme, and suggested that that ship of theirs, which belongs to the Australian people, ought to be uh, used more in a <coughs> diplomatic sense across the Pacific. Why don't you put on that ship a whole bunch of young Australians and have them tour the Pacific Islands? It took them five minutes to see the sense in that. We are still working towards trying to get that to happen, to get this young endeavour tall ship, visit the Pacific with young Australians of Pacific Island heritage, of Anglo heritage, of Indigenous heritage, uh, to re-engage with a region which is at our doorstep um, and of which we feel is um, very easy to ignore. So one of the, the things we're trying to do is not just have this uh, conversation fest, we're trying to get some real um, uh, initiatives happening to, to, to put the spotlight on that. The, the not-for-profit organisation, Orvava, the name Orvava is the Pacific Banyan Tree. We chose that word as the name of the organisation because the Pacific Banyan Tree, and it would be similar across the Pacific, is the tree where the chief or the king would call his people for him to engage them under. So traditionally in the Pacific, that tree is where you would have this citizen diplomacy happening. As well as that, the, the, uh, the Pacific swallow bird uses uh, the Orvava as um, shelter, as security, and as sustenance. There is a Tongan proverb that says, Horope misi he Orvava which is the swallow will always seek the Orvava for shelter, sustenance and security. Hopefully, with citizen diplomacy happening alongside the efforts that we've, we've, uh, um, we've made over a number of years with the Pacific Island communities, hopefully this idea of citizen diplomacy can cement this idea of finding somewhere where these uh, communities of which I love so very dearly, can find sustenance, security, and um, whatever it is that it takes to be able to add value to this society. 
We're not after any handouts. We're after the opportunity to show um, that we can contribute. Contribute positively, not just um, in the Wallabies team or um, being a doorman at a club or, or something like that. Uh, there are so many disengaged young Pacific Islander um, people in the bracket of 16 to 25 who feel so disengaged with their own community and don't reach their full potential to contribute to Australia because of issues that are out of their control. So, apart from being extremely grateful for the opportunity to talk about this in public, and I hope I get the opportunity to do that more and more, uh, I'm sure that I'll, I'll hone my presentation a bit better as time goes on. But I will not ever be uh, accused, and there are uh, plenty members of the Pacific Island community who are in the same boat. Um, we will never be accused of not being persistent in um, trying to highlight that this small part of Australian citizenship or citizen citizenry, this small um, group of Australians of a Pacific heritage can contribute much better um, uh, to this society and it, this, this whole notion of uh, citizen diplomacy um, would be possibly, I can see, uh, one of the best methods we can use to achieve that. So I think I've rambled on for, for far too long, but um, as I said at the start, I've told you what I'm not, and I hope that you can see I'm just not a poor Islander boy trying to make it in, the, in, in a white man's world. I'm someone who is wanting to, to uh, enhance, I suppose, or further enrich uh, Australia's diversity, and also it's, as you mentioned before, um, Melissa, Australia's image into the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Akani. That was wonderful. Um, I do feel very ignorant after that, though. I did not know half what you just told me until today, so thank you very much.